My guest today is Janet Zand. She has over 30 years of private practice experience in natural medicine, including acupuncture, herbal medicine, functional medicine, and nutrition. Janet is the author of Smart Medicine for a Healthier Child, A Parent's Guide to Medical Emergencies, Smart Medicine for Healthy Living, and The Nitric Oxide Solution. She currently writes a popular weekly women's health e-alert. In 2015, she was also acknowledged by the National Nutritional Food Association and New Hope as a thought leader and innovator in the natural products industry. And we all agree with that uh, uh, recognition. Janet co-founded Zand Herbal Formulas and was its chairman, chairman of the board for more than 20 years. So Janet, thanks for joining us today. It's really nice to see you and to hear you. Thanks for uh, having me, Jack. Thanks. Uh, can I jump right in with the Zand Herbal Formulas? Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I was early in the days as well. And remember, I think I remember it when it was Mick Zand. Am I misremembering yes. that? Or is yes, that? That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, I thought I'd heard you'd sold your interest in that company quite some time ago. Is that true? And yeah, even I, it, it was uh, around 2002. Oh, so, well. These days, anything in the 2000s doesn't seem like that long ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe, so could you tell our audience a little bit about your career, you know, kind of how you got started and then what led to um, starting a company? And that was, you know, very early days. I mean, it seems like everybody has a herbal line now these days, but um, you were one of the first. And uh, I think that'll add, provide some insight for uh, our audience who might want to do the same thing. Sure. Well, for me, herbs, natural medicine, acupuncture have always been magic. And at, I think at the root of my love for this magic was, I mean, I remember the day that I walked into acupuncture class, although this, my company started before I went to acupuncture school. Yeah because I was trained as a natural, you know, natural. So that, that yeah. came first. Yeah. yeah. But I remember the day that I was taught yin and yang and my whole head blew up, you know, but anyway, I'll, I'll get to that. But anyway, so back to my love for natural medicine and Chinese medicine, I, I got so excited. I was young, I was passionate, and I wanted to share it with everybody I knew. Mm -hmm. And finally I realized, hey, you know, I don't know all that many people. Maybe I want to share this with a lot more people. But with that glorious aspiration came reality. I was baroque. I had no money. I had mounds of bills from naturopathic school mm -hmm. and I needed a job because I wound up in California. There, I couldn't work as mm -hmm. a naturopath. Mm -hmm. So one day I walked into my local health food store, One Life, which was in Venice, California, and it was owned by a commune. Commune. Most people listening to this, you know, under yeah. 50, they're going <laughs> to... Google that, but a long, long time ago, a commune was a place where a bunch of people lived and they shared everything, right? They shared their work, their food, their lovers. I mean, it was a commune. Anyway, there were a few of us in the store that weren't part of the commune and we're very grateful we had a job. So I walk in and a woman named Destiny is breastfeeding her kid. She's at the register. <laughs> for my groceries. She's breastfeeding her kid and her kid, Cedar, who, gosh, no, I have, you know, he's probably 40 years old, but um, <laughs> right now. And um, I said, hey, I need a job. Uh, is there anything here I can do? And she said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm sort of like a natural doctor. She said, well, you see that second floor up there? We're going to turn it into like an herb room with supplements. How'd you like to do that? Oh, great. I said, sign me up. 
and I had a job. So it was Venice and people in Venice at the time, you know, it was sort of like an epicenter of drug addiction and alcohol use. And most people didn't wake up until two o'clock in the afternoon. So I had the entire morning to make herbal compounds and I made them in these huge vats with liquor that I bought across the street at the liquor store. And they would wander in and say, hey, I have a cold, I have a flu, I have back pain, I have a headache. And I would just, you know, siphon off out of my crock pot some herbs in a two ounce bottle and give it to them. And then um, one day a customer walked in and he said, you know, I keep coming here for these bottles and no offense, it doesn't seem that hygienic and surely, oh, oh, that was the other thing. We used to encapsulate herbs for those who didn't want the tincture. Mm -hmm. We would encapsulate them in the same salad bowls that we would have lunch in. <laughs> we were just what about the salad bowl. <laughs> <laughs> those capsules were very popular anyway um so he said to me he said i really think you should turn this into a business and i thought oh that's a good idea and then i thought some more i sobered up and i went whoa whoa i went to school for medicine not business i don't know anything about business and then i looked downstairs and there was michael mcguffin and for those of you who don't know, Michael McGuffin, he's been the APA president, American Herb Product Association for the past 20 years. And um, at the time he had just um, graduated from Johns Hopkins in engineering and um, we were all a little overqualified and he was like moving zucchinis, you know, downstairs. Anyway, so, um, we were pretty much unseasoned business people, but we were hardworking, we were passionate, and we had some great products. Mm -hmm. So um, did I have business training? No. I was lucky enough to have a few amazing mentors, and I really encourage young people starting in the profession find somebody or a couple of people who can really help you. And these days, I mean, it doesn't even have to really be a person you can touch. There's so much inspiration, sure. right? To be yeah. had, or a podcast, yeah. books. I mean, there's just so much, yeah. So that's sort of how I started. Yeah, I actually appreciate the, um, the observation that you were able to be successful without having some of those fundamental business skills because really the most important thing is the right product, right? Yes. And, and the energy to work at it, right? Get up in yes. the morning, Absolutely. work hard all day long right. and find out what you need to know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't need an MBA to do that. You need an right. MBA if you want to go work on Wall Street, but if right. you want to be an entrepreneur, what you really need is, you know, good work ethic right. and persistence. Right. Yeah, persistence. I think that's so true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our students, when they get into practice, it, you don't want to expect that your practice is going to be there overnight. And Absolutely. it really grows one patient at a time, right? Yes. And that one person tells 10 people and they tell 10 people and, and it will grow. But mm -hmm. it takes a certain patience, but right. even more of that persistence, right? And yes. being there at the office. So, uh, you just said so much of, um, I mean, that really speaks to me when I look back at my career, um, because what we do, it, it works and people, right. people want to use what works. Yeah. I mean, I was lucky enough. I mean, you know, now there's the viral thing with social media. I was lucky enough 
to have the viral thing when I was practicing, but mostly I wasn't doing anything heroic. I was just practicing and I just kept practicing. And I think, you know, one note to young acupuncturists that I learned early on is, I mean, my father used to say this thing to me, you got to listen to everybody because you don't know who's going to tell you what. And I was like, oh, God. Dad. But now I look back, I go, wow, you know, I think he was right. Because yeah, smart. I, right? I, when I look back at my own practice, there were two people who totally handed me my practice. One was this very tall, elegant, redheaded woman, beautiful woman. And she, I, I learned after I treated her for digestive order, disorder um, that she was the representative for um, quite a few professional football players and basketball players and other elite athletes. Well, I just treated her digestive problem and she referred, I mean, she totally transformed not only my practice, but my life sure. from who she sent to me. You know? and, um, and then the other person who came in, this is actually a funny story. This actress I was treating at the time was married to a producer and he got torticollis. He had this horrible stiff neck. He was like that. He couldn't move. And he was mad. He was angry. She had brought him into my office and he said, why am I here? Why did you bring me? And he was like expletive, expletive, bad language, horrible language. It was so bad that my assistant came in and she said, yo, I think we got to get rid of this guy. <laughs> I had a male intern at the time who was also a naturopath and acupuncturist, Marcus, and he sort of looked like a brunette Dr. Kildare. He had so much swab, you know, and I said, Marcus, just go in there and like calm him down. And he said, uh, no. I said, well, go in there and take his blood pressure. <laughs> so he goes, he takes blood pressure because he goes, duh, it was high. So <laughs> And so, I, so I got my courage up, I went in, and I really liked his wife, so I, I did want to help him. So I said, I am going to put some points in your, um, in parts of your body that are just going to relax you. They're not going to affect your neck. And then after a tiny bit, when you're a little bit relaxed, then I'm going to treat your neck. He said, rah, rah. and I said, you just have to get with me here and just calm down because you're going to clear out my home office. <laughs> so I said, rah, rah, rah. so, you know, I did the, the most obvious, you know, liver three, stomach 36, shen men, and I left the room because I just couldn't be in there with him. And his, he's still growling at his wife. And when the growling sort of lowered, I walked back in. I said, now I'm going to put a needle in your hand. You are not going to like this needle. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's going to help your neck. Oh, put the heavy needle in there. So I do small intestine three. And he looks down. Oh, that's the other thing. He wouldn't lay down. He said, no, I'm sitting in the chair. I am not laying down. No, okay, fine. So anyway, um, he, uh, I, I'm putting in SA3 and he's, you know, growling. That hurts. And then I left it in literally like three minutes later. He started, I said, okay, now turn your head. And he turns his head and he goes, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm fine. I have no pain. Well, I always, when I look back on my career, I always say grapey one and small intestine three. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Because he referred me, if you look at the tree, hundreds of patients. Right. And so did Meryl. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, you just never know. You just have to keep at it. And I think a very important thing for young people is to treat what you enjoy treating. Mm. And get really good at it. Yeah. You know? And know you can ace it. No matter who walks in with X, you got it. Yeah, it's a good it's a good advice. I mean, we've said that to our alum that by specializing, it's kind of a win win because one, you're involved in the area that you're most passionate about. Yes, you're also going to be the best at, and mm -hmm. the people that are coming into your office right. are going to be playing to your strengths. Exactly. Right. So, exactly. so that can really be a, a winning formula. Right. Um, the other thing that we try to get across is that your reputation starts today, right? And so you never, and as in your case, right? You never know who the person you're going to be talking to that's going to be so influential to your career. So, yeah. 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 What's the proportion of your practice now? That's how do you balance the naturopathy and and the and the Chinese medicine? I I look at a patient. I assess what I think is at the root, but I don't start, by, I never start by treating the root. What I mm -hmm. do is I look at a patient and I say, okay, what of everything you're here for, what bothers you the most? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it that bothers you the most? And they'll go, you know, my headache. So I treat their headache. And then after they're better, which is usually in short order because I use everything. I use acupuncture, I use Chinese herbs, I use homeopathy, even though I think we're not supposed to even say that word. Um, and I use a lot of blood testing, a lot of blood testing. I, mm -hmm. I do a lot of blood testing. I think, you know, if someone looked at my practice, they would say I'm, a functional physician with all of these auxiliary tools uh -huh. but i'll use anything to get where i want to go and you know early on in my career i had a reputation of always having a really full office well it wasn't like i was real busy when i first started i just would never let anybody leave until they felt that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I sometimes have like and people in my office at once. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. know Richard Nimsau? No. Do you know the name? He um I'll get his title wrong, but he was uh, uh like the director of the VA. Oh wow. and, and he's the I believe he's like the executive editor of the medical acupuncture journal. Oh, uh, and so he was in San Diego for quite some time and we had him over to the clinic talked about his approach. He, same thing, would not let the patient leave unless they got some effect, some positive right. effect. So he would do, you know, big points, you know, LA for something 30. Oh, that didn't work. Um, now I'm going to do ear points, you right. know, and then I'm going to do hand points until right. so probably the patient just said, okay, whatever you say, I'm better. I'm out of here. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it is, again, you know, kind of back to persistence, uh, but also not being afraid to try different things um, yeah. with the patient, as long as you're sensitive to their time and everything, right, obviously. Right, right. Um, I mean, and it's one great thing about Chinese medicine, um, and particularly in this country, we can embrace so many of the tools from yeah. outside of traditional Chinese medicine, right? So if you want to do blood work, if you want to use nutraceuticals, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously any of the manual therapies, you know, that yeah. would cross from tui non to sort of physical right. therapy. I mean, like you said, homeopathy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would use it all unless I was certain that it was, you know, grossly outside my scope of right. practice. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things when you mentioned blood work, I was uh, intrigued by, I, I've certainly 
I'm aware of it from a diagnostic perspective, but I wonder is how much you might use for actually indicating progress. So where you would oh. see, oh, you know, I'm, I'm treating a liver disorder and I'm seeing ah. that those tests are ah. getting better. Totally. Yeah. Well, I, um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I feel a patient's pulse and the liver pulse is not good. It's too full, there's too much heat, there's dampness, there's stagnation. I send them and their liver enzymes are elevated, their lipids are upside down. Mm -hmm. And I treat them typically with Chinese herbs mm -hmm. and some acupuncture. And um, I retest in three months and things are beautiful, you know. Oh, that's great. Um, so I, I really, and, and I think I use it, I mean, we can tell when someone comes in and their pulse is infinitely better, you know the blood work is going to be better. Mm -hmm. But I always run the test because I want to show the patient, look, yeah. you by yourself, you altered your diet. Are you perfect? No, but you altered your diet. You took the herbs, you came in for treatment, and guess what? You are patently better. Yeah. Yeah, I think having those objective signs yes. really helps the patient. Um, aff affirm what they've been doing. And I don't know how, if you experienced this much, but um, it was common for me to see that someone came in for something that would get better, but then that was behind them. Now they've got something else. <laughs> it's like, well, remember, you really came in from your back, right? That's better. Oh, yeah, but not my digestion or not my fatigue, right? So it's nice to remind them that, oh, here's the, the main com or original complaint anyway, and here's it's better. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, so you're not only uh, uh, the founder of a, of a, of a business, uh, an herbal company, but you're also an author. Yes. And, um, you know, what, how do you balance the practice with, you know, the time to write? And, you know, obviously you, you teach, you're always very generous, to come to Pacific mm -hmm. Symposium. Um, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. How, how do you manage you know, uh, I, I well, like all of us, I love it, you yeah. know, and I get a lot of joy from it. Um, I'm a little better at time management than I was. Um, am I stretched? Yeah. Am I sometimes tired? Yeah. yeah. But I remember when I was younger, um, I had a good friend and he used to say, yo, sand, greatness, it doesn't come from comfort. <laughs> and <laughs> I remember in the back of my mind, I'd go, Steve, I can assure you, I am not comfortable. So um, I'm not nearly as strung out as I was when I was younger, because I hardly slept when I was younger. Now I sleep like a normal person. Um, but uh, I think things are still exciting for me. So I don't see it as a burden. Yeah, I'm well, that's so great to up. hear. Yeah, yeah, that's really great to hear. I was so pleasantly surprised to be, I forget where I saw it, and you know, it was like AMPM Mini Mart or something on the <laughs> magazine rack. And there's this journal, magazine, how you, whatever you would want to call it. And I was, Janet Sand. And I look and every, so it's basically, you'd put together a magazine where every article was by you, if I, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And um, how did that come about? I'm curious. I mean, is that, a, did a publisher reach out to you? Was it your idea? I, no, it was certainly not my idea. You know, in my life, I, I feel like I've been touched. I've been really lucky. And I think all of us who are led to traditional Chinese medicine, I think just that is so much luck, you know? Sure. Anyway, I was approached by a publisher and he said, look, my wife really likes you and she likes this and she likes that. I had never met the wife, but she had read my, some of the books mm -hmm. and uh, tried some products and, and she had been using the, pro the products since the eighties. And he said, so how about this? And he put the whole thing together. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Interesting. He, he shepherded the whole thing and he did really well with it. 
So. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I, yeah. I wondered kind of, you know, yeah. what the actual. And uh, that's the other yeah. thing. If, if you're a young practitioner, I always tell young people, start writing. You know, yeah. you can go online, you can have a yeah. blog, yeah. and start. Um, I always tell the students who write me, you know, um, think big and act small. Yeah. So in other yeah. words, if you're, you know, get to know your neighborhood, you know, figure out what troubles the people in your neighborhood mm-hmm. and figure out how you can solve those health problems and address yeah. them yeah. and have little seminars. I never did this, but I, I did teach a lot locally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I always noticed whenever I taught, people would come see me. And yeah. I think that it's a great outlet. And, and if you don't like public speaking, which I don't, I mean, I, I still do it. It still causes me huge anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> but, I understand that. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's um, sort of the same thing. But um, if you don't like it, you don't want to do that, these days, just write a blog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some have a podcast. You know, there, there's so many ways to reach out. Sure. Yeah, you know, there's, and that, your advice really confirms kind of brain research that, you know, start with steps that don't freak yourself out. Right. Right. So it's like, I want to get in shape. I'm like, oh, I'm going to work out an hour a day. And you're no. not going to do that, you know, because you, you're, your your nervous system will just go no 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 that's going to work but if you go oh i'm going to work out for one minute a day right you create this virtuous cycle where you go oh that felt good so i'll just do five minutes then ten minutes yeah. so yeah. and it's the same thing so mm-hmm. i don't want to do public speaking so i'll write a i'll write a blog but then someone right. will come along and see that and say hey can you speak at my business luncheon or whatever and you're going to want to go I don't want to do that, but just say yes. Say, right. That's what I did. Right. When that's it. Just, me. Yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? He's going to make me speak in front of all those people. Jack, I hate that. When I had my company, I would have to do that. But I always would say, please, just put me on the radio. <laughs> yeah. Somehow the radio didn't intimidate me. Yeah. But being front and center with real people, I was yeah. a mess. And yeah, I remember saying yes to you. And, oof. Yeah. 1989. Yeah, it was a scary thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, it is it, one of the things that practitioners or any public speaker in our field has as an advantage is that it's so visually appealing. Yes. Right. And so you could put together PowerPoints right. with, with little videos of what we do, um, especially when you're speaking to a lay audience. Mm-hmm. They're fascinated by it, right? right? Right. And then after you show them that, you say, are there any questions, right? And then they right. don't expect that to be a very polished presentation. Exactly. Um, and it kind of reduces that anxiety that we all have, I think, about right. public speaking, right? Um, so, and, and, and it is generally unavoidable at some point <laughs> if you want to build your practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, with the meetups that you can find now, mm-hmm. find one that doesn't freak you out. Right? Exactly. It's a group that shares either a real need for what you have to provide mm-hmm. or share some other common interests that you have. You know, yes. maybe it's a group of artists or whatever, or dancers or athletes. Mm-hmm. So you just go to that and then you start telling people I'm an acupuncturist mm-hmm. and then everybody's going to tell you about their back and neck problems. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so then you just hand out your cards, right? But you do have to leave the house in the morning to, get, to make that happen, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, uh, let's see. Um, what else for, you know, a couple of things that you mentioned, and we kind of keep referring to new or younger practitioners, but I think all these things apply even to, um, in fact, maybe in some sense, what you've done with the writing and publishing to more uh, seasoned practitioners, mm-hmm. maybe getting to the point in their career where like, 
maybe they're doing, been doing great for 15, 10 or 15 or more years. They're going, oh, I'd like to dial it back a little bit and maybe create another kind of income stream, something that keeps me involved yeah. in what I'm passionate about, but I'm not on my feet as long, mm -hmm. right? And so these ideas about blogs and then, you know, newsletters and then a book, right? And there are so many, so many things that we still need in this profession. Yes. Uh, I mean, there's, you can name a hundred different topics where it doesn't have to be, uh, I'm going to talk to Matt Callison tomorrow, where he spent 25 years writing, you know, this book that weighs like 50 pounds, right. it, which is a great book, by yes. the way, and everybody, every it's acupuncture should, should have it. Um, yeah. But you don't have to do that. Right. right? I uh, mean, you know, I really agree with that because there's no such thing as a perfect plan. You know, I think the most important thing for young and seasoned acupuncturists and all health practitioners is you just have to start, you know, like that Nike slogan, just do it. Yeah. You really right. just have to start and find your sweet spot. Right. Yeah. And then like we were saying, in a way that, you know, the long journey starts with one little step, right? And make the step that you can make. Yes. But when you're going in the right direction, yeah. it feels so much better mm -hmm. than being either stagnant or going backwards. Yeah. All right. So, um, Jana, we, I want to thank you again for the time that you spent here with me. Um, I think that any of our listeners who think about the things that you've said and just apply one aspect of your wisdom um, is, is going to... Uh, you know, really see the rewards. And um, again, just thanks a lot. It was well, really great you. to see you. Thanks. And yeah, and 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 <laughs> I guess one of the ways you stay in such great shape is by playing baseball. I just <laughs> found out recently. <laughs> but uh, keep the glove in front of your face. <laughs> I know that was such a spazzy moment. <laughs> uh, well. It lets us know that you're uh, that you're human <laughs> amongst all your achievements. Uh, so thanks much, um, and thanks to everybody that's been listening. Um, we'll post some links to Janet's companies um, and her books um, in the show notes. And as always, if you have any comments or questions for me, you can reach me at jmiller at pacificcollege.edu. Always love to hear from practitioners that are in the field, um, your ideas about Chinese medicine and and how you're growing your career. So thanks for joining us today.